All right, we're in. We're live. We're here, people. We got people in here. We got about 13 so far. <laughs> we'll get some more rolling in. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good night. We we're having little difficulties, so uh, appreciate the patience If uh, for those that are still hanging around and joining us. Uh, man, I'll tell you what, guys. It is never a dull day or week in privacy. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's why it's so intriguing, so uh, amazing, and uh, just excited to kind of to have both of you on today to discuss this this new bipartisan and just kind of scope it out together and any questions that you guys have please uh shoot them in our chat we're here i'm monitoring that right now Ooh, Brittany's on the edge of her seat or brit sorry <laughs> hey brit sorry <laughs> Thanks for well, don't 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 be uh, too much too much on the edge there hopefully you you're got some carpet or something but uh, let's let's go ahead and dive into this. So uh, for those that don't know who I am, my name is Cameron Ivey. I'm one of the marketing managers at Transcend. Um, I also host a, a podcast called Privacy Please. And uh, I got some awesome people with me today. So uh, Ron DeJesus is the first ever field chief privacy officer at uh, Transcend as well. So Ron, thanks for being here, taking the time to kind of discuss this today. How are you doing Absolutely. today? Absolutely. Uh, amazing. It's been week three or four. I can't really tell. Um, but <laughs> just getting back from PS, or, ah, GPS, not PSR. Um, and that was an incredible week meeting uh, so many privacy pros. And this is my first webinar with Transcend as FCPO. So I'm incredibly excited. Awesome. And Dave, go ahead and like introduce yourself a little bit. Um, I know you're from Run Runway Strategies. Uh, you're also ex-Uber. But uh, go ahead and tell the folks a little bit about yourself. Of course. Thanks, Cameron. I appreciate everyone taking their lunch break with us here or their breakfast, depending on which coast you're on. Uh, my name is Dave Barmore. I'm one of the co-founders of Runway Strategies, which is a consultancy that helps companies navigate all the policy and regulatory issues, uh, of which there are many. I'm based out of Washington, D.C., and I was telling these guys uh, there's still remnants of all the Transcend uh, branding and billboards all over the city. I just saw one uh, still uh, near a bus stop downtown <laughs> D.C., so we're still continuing uh, the party here. That's awesome. Yeah, unfortunately, when we were there, Dave, uh, we got to witness the uh, cold and rain. It felt more like Seattle or uh, the EU. It's beautiful out now. I'm sorry you all had that uh, that crummy week of, of weather. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, so before we dive into everything, just want to start off with something fun. Um, what's something that you guys do that would be considered something that an old person would do? Like, what's your old person thing? Do you have one thing that's just kind of like, <laughs> huh. just... Oh, man? <laughs> oh well, I used to, I used to knit actually, but I got Ooh. so frustrated. Yeah, I got so I went to classes, but I got so frustrated because all my lines would always get crooked that I just stopped. So. <laughs> I don't actually do that anymore, but I did used to knit anyway. I don't know if I can stop knitting. I will say I have a basset hound, and people say that my basset hound looks like an old man if an old man were in dog form. So maybe <laughs> I'll uh, I'll go I'll go with that one. Okay. <laughs> I like it. Awesome. Well, okay. So with everybody attending, obviously the the big thing is about the American Privacy Rights Act, or now known as obviously we love acronyms in privacy and security. So AP. RA. Dave, why don't you just give us like a high level of what, what is this? Like, how did we get here? What does this mean? Um, just kind of fill us in on what, what's going on today. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think I can say with confidence that very few people saw this coming with the weekend announcement um, of this agreement with the American Privacy Rights Act. Cameron, as you mentioned, Congress loves their acronyms. They try to make these very clever acronyms based on the subject matter uh, of the bill. APRA doesn't really roll off the tongue, but... Um, Remember can spam, Dave? That, yeah. that was pretty good. <laughs> um, but really, this is, it's a huge momentous deal because it's really largely been almost two decades uh, that this has been, been developing. It's back in 1998 where the Federal Trade Commission actually made a recommendation to Congress that they should look to regulate uh, data privacy. Mm -hmm. So uh, fast forward to 2024. And while we still have a long road, uh, this is a major deal that there's been an agreement. So when we say bipartisan, bicameral, I'm going to break that down a little bit because that is significant in and of itself. And I'm going to go a little schoolhouse rock on everyone. I promise I won't sing. But I do think for those 
that aren't, uh, aren't aware of kind of the process <laughs> that these bills go through, I think it might be helpful just to do a really quick kind of crash course, um, just so folks kind of know what to expect. So um, again, this agreement uh, is, would set a uniform uh, standard for how com companies can and covered entities can process uh, consumers' data privacy. It is bipartisan in that, so we have two chambers at the federal level, the House of Representatives and the Senate. So the, the main stakeholders that we're dealing with here uh, is a woman on the House side named Kathy McMorris Rogers. Uh, she is a member of the Republican leadership. Um, she has been a huge proponent of uh, federal data privacy framework for years now. Uh, this has been a, a huge issue for her. Um, she's also announced that she's retiring. So I think that is significant in that um, she's going to be done at the end of the year. And I know she would love to say that she helped shepherd uh, this milestone uh, bill through through Congress. So um, like I said, she's been out there on this issue just two years ago. Uh, another acronym that I'm sure some of you are familiar with, ADPA, again, um, not the, the sexiest one there, but the American uh, Data Privacy uh, and Protection Act um, mm -hmm. that originated out of the House. Again, Kathy McMorris Rogers was pushing for that. Um, that made it out of the House Energy and Commerce Committee by a historic vote of 53 to 2. So nearly unanimous vote that got out of committee. That's about as far as it went. So this is back in 2022. Um, similar bill to what we're talking about today, but um, never made it past that committee vote due to reasons that we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, spoiler alert, preemption, uh, private right of action. Those are all issues that kind of led to the unfortunate demise of ADPA back uh, two years ago. Um, so we've got Kathy McMorris Rogers on the House side. On the Senate side, we've got um, a Senator Maria Cantwell. She is the chair of the Senate Commerce Committee. She is a Democrat. So I think what we saw this weekend was an agreement between the two chairs of the respective Commerce Committees, uh, basically saying, hey, we agree on draft text. We're not even dealing with the introduced bill yet. We right. just have a draft discussion. But I think, again, that there's been an agreement on uh, what the contours of a federal privacy framework, that's huge. Uh, again, there's a lot of ground left to cover, but um, that's where we're at. In the meantime, too, you know, we've got up to 15 states that have passed comprehensive uh, data privacy legislation at the state level. So we're looking at a patchwork of bills. Just in 2024 alone, we've had four states just this past weekend, uh, Kentucky and, and Maryland um, are close to signing uh, their respective comprehensive data privacy laws. So, um, there's been a lot of movement at the state level, just because the states have said, "Hey, if, if Congress isn't going to act, we're going to we're going to move and make sure our citizens are are protected." Um, so I think this is a big deal, and that this would preempt all of those state bills that have passed. Um, those non sectoral kind of comprehensive data privacy laws would all be preempted by this by this bill. So anyway, that was a lot, but I think it's just helpful to understand kind of where we're at. Again, we're yeah. just dealing with a draft bill. There's no bill number. Uh, we haven't had committee hearings yet. We've got a lot more to, a lot more ground to cover before this becomes law. But um, again, historic moment, all the same. So now, Ron, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I just, um, you know, for us in the privacy community, um, you know, the two days after GPS, when we got the news. It was incredibly electric and exciting. I think that's really great to see when, you know, something like this comes along and the community is buzzing about it. I mean, we did see it with ADPA um, and there's some folks that were like, oh, this again. Um, but it was, <laughs> it's funny because when I was at GPS, I was doing a video series with some privacy pros. And one of my questions was, do you think we're going to get a national privacy law this year? Um, and every single answer was no. Uh, it's probably still probably true, but you know the fact yeah. that it's been stagnant for the past two years, and now to finally see another bipartisan, bicameral effort um, is just incredibly exciting. So, yeah, we're thrilled. To to that point, why do you think now? Why now? Why did this come out now? Do you? I mean, do yeah. we even know? I think. I, go yeah. ahead, Dave. Yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say. Um, Again, I think it was a surprise to many, many people. People kind of wrote this year off as, hey, it's an election year. 
Um, we've already got a historically unproductive um, Congress just in terms of the number of bills that are being passed, but let alone in an election year, usually things kind of uh, die down a bit. So I think people right. were very surprised. But I, if I had to guess, I think we have a couple factors that have led to this announcement. One, just with the surge in AI, uh, Congress has also looked to get into how it can legislate on this nascent technology with generative AI. Um, a lot of, of members of Congress have even pointed out hey, this is all well and good, but we haven't even agreed on what the contours are for a data privacy uh, framework. Right. And I think a lot of members of Congress see that as a, as a foundation for then building on and addressing a lot of the issues that we're dealing with on the AI front. And again, I think going back to the politics of it, um, with Kathy McMorris Rogers retiring, I think she's really been pushing for this. And so I imagine she's been uh, having a lot of, of serious conversations on the Senate side and just really shoring up support so she can try to get this passed um, before she before she hangs her hat and, and retires. So I, think well, she's, I don't know if you have anything else to add. She, she's yeah. also probably a really big uh, Taylor Swift fan is what I'm guessing too. Because <laughs> you know she's put her voice in there. Anyways, Ron? Yeah, no, I think Dave's exactly right. I, I don't necessarily there's a, think there's a link between the passing of the historic EU AI Act, but I certainly think there's probably some motivations there. You know, the act itself has certain terminology around algorithms and high impact social media companies. So definitely using terminology of the time and 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 also to Dave's point, you know, all these states are coming up with their their own laws and going forward. And I think that is probably a good prompt for, um, you know, something to do at the federal level. But, but yeah, I think AI top of mind for folks and the fact that there is AI specific provisions in this uh, in this bill is, is is definitely telling. The global competitiveness too. I think the fact that the U.S. hasn't been able to agree on something, and you know, you've had GDPR, and and really, I've seen reporting that the U.S. is really the last kind of global population to not have a uh, one of the last uh, global populations to not have a national privacy framework. So I think you know that's a black eye for for Congress. They want to show that they're being out there on this issue and. Mm. Um, I think it'd be very ceremonial to to have this pass, if nothing else, is to show the world that we we can agree on on how to protect our our consumers' privacy. Yeah, that's a good point. And and I think what's exciting, like you were saying, Ron, is that all the people you talk to at GPS were like, "No, this is not going to happen." And then that happens, so it kind of makes it a reality that this yeah. actually could happen this year. It's possible now. And we're all ever. waiting with bated breath. We're not, you know, sure. we're not holding our breath, and but. It, something that comes out at the federal level is always going to be exciting in this right. community. So, and, and obviously it, uh, it brings excitement. It brings questions from other laws that are in place. Let's kind of, let's dive into some, some of the, the, the key provisions of the bill. Uh, if, if one of you guys want to like highlight one or a couple, it doesn't matter. Let's highlight on some of those and, and kind of dive into what that, what the implications may mean or what that impact may be. Um, when it comes to data privacy in the U.S. Yeah. yeah, Dave, if you want to start and I'll riff on yours. Yep. Yeah, sounds great. Um, so super high level, again, kind of bucketing out the different sections of the, the draft bill. Um, it's key focus on, key focus is on um, requiring data minimization. Mm -hmm. So requiring, you know, how they define covered entities to collect only the necessary amount of, of data to provide that type of service they're looking um, for the consumer. Um, so data minimization is a huge part of, of uh, the draft bill. It also provides consumers rights to opt out of targeted advertising, provides consumers the, the right to view, uh, correct, export, and, and delete their data. Um, it tackles some of the data security provisions and, and addresses some of those um, issues by requiring organizations to install privacy officers. Um, and if the organization is past a certain threshold and what they deem a large um, data collector, they have to do even more where they install not only a privacy officer, but also a data security officer as well. Um, so there are heightened obligations for large data holders. There's a national data broker registry in here. Enforcement, you know, lovely teeth, uh, as we like to refer, uh, refer to enforcement. Um, 
there's a lot in here in terms of how they will actually look to enforce this law. Mm -hmm. um, FTC in conjunction with state attorneys general, um, they will be in charged with kind of enforcing the law. Um, I think what's a big point of contention uh, and partly I referenced earlier, what led to the demise of the 2022 bill is an issue called private right of action. So allowing consumers uh, to file suit um, against companies for, uh, you know, infringing on, on their, their rights as outlined in the bill. Um, that's going to be a, a huge sticking point for uh, conservatives. And I think you already see senators like Ted Cruz, who's the ranking member under uh, Maria Cantwell. Um, he's already expressed concerns with the private right of action and how that could uh, be a boon for trial attorneys and, and be very costly for industry to have to comply with that. So that's going to be a real contentious issue on the enforcement side is that is that private right of action. But, um, you know, Ron, I know we've talked a little bit about the algorithm impact assessments. Do you want to dive in a little bit more on, on that and how that differs from some of the other, uh, the California and GDPR laws that already have similar type of laws on the books? Yeah, and just in terms of impact assessments broadly, you know, we've had this requirement with the GDPR in terms of DPIAs needing to be done uh, since 2018. Uh, so it's not a, the, the act of or the requirement to do an assessment is not new to us. Um, the algorithm impact assessment, obviously, not to be confused with the actual privacy impact assessment requirement in um, in APRA. Sorry, I'm, I'm calling it out, Cam. I'm going to call it APRA. <laughs> <laughs> APRA, whatever. But, you know, not to be confused with the actual need to do PIAs. So this algorithm impact assessment is, you know, if you're actually using machine learning to um actually engage with uh, personal data processing. Uh, so above and beyond the actual personal privacy impact assessment, there's this new obligation to, to do that. Again, if you are uh, gonna be utilizing uh, algorithms in your decision-making. So kind of stepping back a bit, just keep in mind that this is you know, purportedly a privacy and data protection law, but you now have kind of elements from what the EU AI Act has done in terms of its conformity assessment for for AI use kind of interweaved and kind of thrown in there mm. with posing as you know a, a broad privacy and data protection uh, act. One thing I wanted to go back to that Dave had mentioned was around data minimization. I actually think it's it's great to see that kind of first principles privacy principle kind of codified uh, in uh, this bill. We did see it with ADPA, but the fact that we have, you know, ever since the 80s, you know, the OECD uh, guidelines talking about purpose limitation, GDPR, the EU directive, the pre GDPR, you know, talking about purpose limitations. So it's really good to see a first kind of, you know, uh, table stakes thing like datamization be front and center and top of mind for, uh, for this bill. Uh, you know, as an OG in this profession, it's, it's just good to see the fact that we're starting from first principles around only collect what you need, because uh, that obviously decreases the risk going forward so it's, it's really good to see that yeah what is, what does this mean for privacy programs like what is it I, when you hear about like when you read this what what was your thoughts when it comes to other cpos what, what should they be looking at i i don't want to speak for all cpos but i think Fair. just given you know um my experience leading companies in that capacity i think it's just going to be incredibly um useful and efficient for us. One of the things that I kind of reminisce about, well, not, maybe that's the wrong term, but, you know, back in the day when we had pre-DGPR, when we had, you know, the 20 plus EU member state acts, I maintained this giant Excel spreadsheet of every single act kind not of categorized. It's like, Excel. we didn't have Google Docs back then. <laughs> that's <laughs> so true. I am that old, which oh. is why I was knitting for a while. But uh, so, so, yeah, I, this Excel spreadsheet that kind of, you know, categorized your requirements based on privacy principle, with, whether it was GAP or whatever framework you're using. And we, we had to do that with, you know, and once GDPR came along, it was a huge sigh of relief because you could get rid of the, the 20 plus, you know, member state acts. And, and now with California and the, and Dave, as you mentioned, was it 17 or, or 16 state 16, acts in play? Yeah. 17 if you count Florida. Oh, yeah. Right, which... Florida, which is disputable, right? Yeah. So um, we're now back to this 
we're now back to going back to our Excel spreadsheets, you know, um, to to kind of figure out how to rationalize and come to this, you know, common baseline of requirements, and then obviously address the ton of outliers that are out there. Uh, Maryland is a good example of that. It, it would, again, just a short, long answer to your question is that we would, I think, really love a national law um, sure. uh, to, to to create that baseline. And, and obviously, inherently, I think every CPO wants everyone to have um, equal privacy rights, um, which we, we kind of see overseas in the EU already. So, yeah. Because, yeah, Cameron, I think I agree with all of that. But put simply, it's it's one uniform standard, right? Instead of now, what we have is this patchwork of different state laws where right. I never understood why, you know, a resident in California, why is their data any more important than someone in, you know, uh, a state that doesn't have that kind of comprehensive state bill. So I think just to have but that. That's America. Yeah. <laughs> but to have that, you know, national framework in place, I think would be. Just to provide that certainty um, yeah. for for CPOs, I think would be would be huge. So. Mm -hmm. Maybe so, Cameron, if I can go back yeah, to yeah. again to get my crystal ball out here to predict, I think what the issues are that I think a lot of the legislators on the Hill are going to be debating are going back to. And again, you've got to understand these are, are federal lawmakers; they're not experts in data privacy. Um, thankfully, they have a lot of really great qualified staff that um, get really smart on these issues. And some of them have backgrounds in tech that they lend to um, people actually, you know, folks that drafted this bill actually know what they're, they're talking about. But venture to say, you know, all 535 members of Congress, let's not all consider them privacy experts. So I think right. they're going to gravitate towards issues um, that are important based on their politics or their constituencies, right? So I think what's interesting is preemption and the private right of action, I think, are going to be the biggest contentious uh, issues. Um, and we really saw that back in 2022 with ADPA. So like I said, Kathy McMorris Rogers got the bill out of committee. But where it stopped was that um, because it included preemption, so it essentially would have, have nullified the uh, California privacy bill, the whole California delegation was not happy about that. Um, so at the time, Speaker Nancy Pelosi actually made it clear that she would not be bringing forward uh, ADPA to the floor for a vote because of that California preemption issue. And you can already seen since Sunday, the head of the California Privacy Agency putting out a statement saying that, you know, he can't believe that they're looking to usurp states' abilities to regulate in this space. And so right. I think you'll see the reference, you know, this should be a floor, not a ceiling. And what that means is, States are still going to want the ability to add to whatever a federal baseline is, uh, but to be clear, under this uh, under this framework, that would not be the case. This would be a ceiling in which states would not have that ability to kind of tinker and, and add additional uh, provisions onto that. So the preemption issue is going to be big, and you've got, like I mentioned, Ted Cruz, senator from Texas. Texas has their own state privacy bill, so you better believe he's going to be hearing from his state. Yep. Officials saying, hey, we've went through yeah. all this work to pass our own bill. Don't don't, uh, don't let that be all for not. So preemption and adding is super yeah. quickly, Drew, uh, yeah. Dave, California to the mix, you know, on the preemption issue. I, I actually understand their their viewpoints a little bit because, you know, if you guys recall Calopa from 2004, they were pioneers in the space of requiring privacy policies on websites. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's a. Uh, as a pioneer in this space and, and as a first adopter of, of, of privacy as a, a right for its, its um, you know, uh, residents, I, I understand the pushback because, you know, I think they, they there's probably a little of, um, um, of the sense that they wanted to probably maintain a lot of the strict regulation, uh, strict requirements per CCPA and the CIPRA amendments as well. So. I guess I just wanted to say that I understand kind of the state pushback, especially coming from California as leaders in this space. But the preemption issue, I think, exactly to your point, Dave, is going to be a highly contentious one. And, and to be clear, this is a draft bill and we are going to see many amendments offered. That's just the part of you know how the sausage is made. And so we should not expect if, if this does get past the finish line, my guess is that it's going to be 
uh, very different version than what we're currently reacting to over the weekend. That's just how this works, right? You've got the the House committee process, the Senate committee process. They'll both propose amendments. If those go to the respective floors and get voted on and voted out of each chamber, then it goes to what's called a conference committee. They kind of reconcile the differences between the two House and Senate bills. Um, and assuming it gets out of conference committee, it goes to the president's desk for his signature. So again, all that to say a long, a long road ahead. Um, but I do think preemption is going to be, be a big one. Um, the other one too, is just, again, the enforcement piece, uh, the private right of action, not something that Republicans and conservatives are going to, um, take well to, um, right. but to be clear, the reason that Cantwell, Senator Cantwell's, um, involved is that she was insistent on having the private right of action in, uh, in the bill. The reason she didn't support ADPA back in 2022 was that she cited what was weak enforcement provisions within ADPA. And so um, I think you see kind of a strengthened um, uh, private right of action where there was a clause in ADPA that would have allowed two years to go by before individuals could bring forward um, a private right of action. That's no longer part of this. If, if this, as this draft bill states, that two year kind of waiting period is, is taken out. It's six months. Um, so I think you're going to see industry. That's plenty of time for us to just, you know, up level our privacy programs for sure. <laughs> <laughs> six month turnaround. Yeah, that is uh, yeah. It's a quick one, but um, yeah, that's going to be a, a thing that industry pushes back on. I think you're going to see big tech push back uh, on that private right of action piece for sure. Be, to, talking about like the, uh, like the product, the tech side of things. I know Ron, you wanted me to bring this up a little bit. What is what does that kind of look like for organizations um, when it comes to this this bipartisan? Yeah, I I think you know when David mentioned the fact that there not that there isn't any privacy expertise on the kind of the law making end of things, but I, I definitely when I was going through the fifty three or fifty four page document, it was a couple of things that kind of called out to me that kind of demonstrated this lack of understanding of how things happen operationally. So I wanted to touch upon a few of them because they were just kind of fun tidbits. But the um, the first one being this, uh, you know, the requirement to put uh, 10 years plus um, versions of your privacy policy and then also have a log of, you know, material changes plus dates. OK, that that's that. I mean, you know, I, 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 I would really bet on I would it would be hard pressed to find a CPO that can go back that far. Um, and then also, you know, that that's actually um, great for, for, for privacy, for, for consumers and their privacy, because now companies can't get away from making these material changes and then trying to, you know, push them under the rug with a privacy policy or a terms of service update. You know, you'll have all of that kind of auditable and, and in a log, which I find, you know, just just super interesting. So that's yeah. one piece that I think operationally you, you can see that that's kind of a, a high burden. One other thing that popped out to me was this need for CEO kind of certifications of, uh, I believe it's not, not privacy impact assessments, but essentially a CEO needs to certify that they have the um, appropriate security and privacy controls in place, which, you know, as a CPO, that's no matter how you take it, I think it's great because then you get this kind of top level buy-in into the fact that, your privacy program and data security program is is um, quote unquote you know compliant with with uh, these requirements. So you know sometimes the onus is always on the CPO to make these attestations, but now the CEO is required to sign off on on these things, which gives a little bit of of weight to um, you know or. Without actually bringing in a budget, I'm always looking at things operationally, Cameron. So it's it's uh, I think this specifically is going to be so great for for our offices to get budget and resources because we can say, hey, CEO over there, you're gonna have to sign off on this, right? So that's that's super uh, interesting. One other quick thing on the privacy policy piece is now short form um, uh, notices are gonna be required as well. So. I love that some of these kind of um, privacy best principles like this are being codified now, because if we, if you were 
if you had a long form privacy policy and had the the foresight to develop like a layered notice you're already on the right track right so it's it's just really great um as someone who has been doing this like kind of in the weeds on the front lines to see some of this stuff be codified um in a bill so anyway just a couple of call outs that i thought were interesting for more operational folks <laughs> love it a couple of other just things i'll throw out there cameron too yeah. um and i i've seen some reporting based on the draft bill as as we now see it and how it addresses uh the use of of data dealing with minors um, i think it's it's fair to say that there is a huge focus within congress and also at the state level to look into children's like online activity you've seen a this whole slew of bills being passed at the state level Right. looking to regulate kind of social media platforms and, and how they're collecting data. Um, so I, I saw some call outs saying that this bill in particular, um, while it does address and has heightened protections for uh, how companies use data related to minors, um, I think there's a world in which we could also see there are some other federal bills, Kids Online Safety Act, there's a COPPA 2.0. I think there's a world in which those could all get morphed into one kind of big big data privacy bill. Um, and I think the way that this particular APRA was drafted kind of allows that opportunity for other kind of children's focused bills to, to be incorporated at a later date. So I thought that was something to, to call out as well. And there was something to speaking of, of distinct provisions, Ron, um, they did introduce a new term with the, the definitions of high impact social media company, which I thought mm -hmm. was interesting, um, where it's clear they're targeting kind of the big the, the big players there, but um, I don't believe that's been uh, a term of art in any of the other uh, privacy bills that have been passed in California or GDPR or elsewhere. Yeah, I think they might have borrowed that from the EU AI Act that gives distinctions on the, the types of businesses based on size. Uh, but yeah, I, I, it's good to see that that's a, um, an area of focus in terms of, hey, if you're doing immense amount of, of, of processing based on where you are in the space, um, you have X number of requirements. So, so yeah, that's a good point that you brought up about the <clears throat> the minor situation. It just it's uh, it's baffling that it is now finally being taken serious. I guess I know it takes a while for these these bills to be put in place, or like it's just it's nice to finally see uh, a lot of that coming into play. Um, what do you guys think this does for my mindset when it comes to this bill? If it actually gets passed. There's a lot of good things that come out of it. I feel like I feel like something like this that we have a broad, you know, US law that it's going to actually open up opportunities for more privacy budgets and teams growing. I think that'll do you, do you see that happening? That's what I'm kind of thinking. Yeah, I mean, kind of going back to my comment around some of these owners requirements, especially getting, you know, C level sign off, I think that's going to definitely um, impact budgets and resourcing in a in a good way. Yeah. I think whenever you have you know that requirement for someone other than the CPO, and and this is kind of you know alluding to the fact that there is large CISO um, uh, ramifications. You know <laughs> when right. it comes to um, uh, you know possible uh, uh, jail time. Um, I think, you know, it, it serves, again, the, the argument that as a CPO function, as a privacy function, we're going to need budget and, and resources to, to deal with these more, more onus requirements, you know, including increased PIAs, increased algorithm impact assessments, um, and then also, obviously, CAM, um, need for tooling, right? So right. Uh, with, with these, you know, now um, increased uh requirements to do impact assessments how are we going to operationally do that without a a, a sufficient tool right. so yeah i think i think the bill in and of itself is is great for 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 cpos who 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 need that staffing um but on the flip side it's going to make things a lot more efficient right we're not going to have to deal with the uh 16 or 17 if you count florida uh, outlier requirements so that will definitely make our lives easier yeah yeah um maverick posted a question in here um <laughs> Thanks for oh. the question, Maverick. Um, yeah. What, what Maverick. do you think of any impact this will have, uh, the bill will have on tick, the TikTok ban? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I... You could take that one first. 
I don't know if there's many, you know, obviously very different um, issue, uh, you know, with the, what, what's being discussed with the, the TikTok bill. But I do think what's illuminating about the TikTok bill is just how there was overwhelming support to get that out of the house, right? So that where that stands currently is that it was uh, approved and, and voted out of the house. It now has essentially been stalled. Uh, and, you know, I think we'll go through a lengthy kind of committee process in the Senate. You are seeing some senior senators show their support. But um, I think, you know, that was a hugely, uh, very highly publicized bill. Um, and yet I, I still think we can't say with certainty whether or not that's going to get passed. So the mm -hmm. only parallel I would say there is, again, um, there's a lot of ground to cover before this thing uh, gets sent to president's desk. Um, you're going to have a lot of interest coming out, uh, business interests, you know, privacy advocacy groups. There's this is going to be a, a free for all in terms of just the lobbying and advocacy efforts that are going to be going into it, which is a good thing. That's part of uh, being in a democracy, but it's also uh, I think it's it just shows the complexity uh, of, of just trying to set this baseline. And so I, I think we need to be kind of clear eyed on on uh, expectations of whether or not this will get past the finish line there. Yeah, I would say first Maverick, your TikTok account is probably still safe. <laughs> <laughs> Maverick, super um, active on on the social media front, but um, obviously I would assume TikTok to be defined as a high impact social media company. So you know, they would have to comply with those um, onerous requirements. And I, I assume that they're probably going to push back as a as someone as an entity in the tech sector around the more, you know, uh, stringent requirements around explicit consent uh, needed for a collection of sensitive information and then the disclosure of that and the sharing. So I definitely think that at least from a uh, TikTok company um, perspective itself, they're probably going to push back. Um, on a lot of this stuff. And just the, the again, going back to the private right of action too, right? But now that if this were to be passed, companies like TikTok could be open for lawsuits, uh, right. seeking damages um, where, and, and it's, it's interesting too, they also include a prohibition on um, pre-arbitration, basically saying that if the uh, claim exceeds a certain threshold, the companies aren't able to go through the arbitration process. They have to go uh, and, and pursue litigation. So th that is not going to be something that companies are going to take lightly. So again, I think you're going to see a big pushback on that piece in particular from, from big tech, including companies like TikTok. What, what should we anticipate? Like, what do you foresee happening the rest of this year when it comes to this? What, what could we look for? What can we prepare for? What, anything that we can give our listeners um, ideas of what this may look like? Again, so... Uh, I think it's great this is out there. You're going to hear a lot about APRA. And so I think um, these legislators, they're going to be hitting the road, talking about this, trying to drum up support um, from consumers, from industry, from you know privacy advocacy groups. You're going to be hearing a lot about this. I think what to expect. You're going to see likely in the next month or two, probably some committee hearings in both the Senate Commerce and the House Energy and Commerce Committees. Again, this is where I think it'll be really telling to kind of see the different um, line of questioning from members of Congress that will really kind of, I think, be telling and in, in what we should expect conservatives, what we should expect yeah. from more progressive uh, members. Um, the committees uh, and the committee hearings, I think, will be really interesting. But again, they've got a short window. Uh, the congressional session ends at the end of this year. So with the, the general election. So if they're not able to get this passed by the end of the year, the, the clock starts over in January. And they've got to start pushing this boulder up a hill uh, in 2025 again. So they've got got a short window, but um, I think it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Yeah. And then just from the operational perspective and, and Dave, I love the fact that you, you bring the kind of on the hill perspective with the, um, with those updates, but from an on the ground perspective, I would say, you know, as, as assuming a lot of folks here already have mature or, you know, fit for purpose privacy programs, I think it's kind of a wait and see kind of moment. We, we, we already have, if I'm if I'm looking again at what the bill above and beyond like those kind of more onerous outliers, if you already have an established privacy program, you already have you know 
uh, privacy impact assessment and DPIA workflows. You already have privacy notices and transparency. You probably have a process to ensure that you're respecting and honoring individual consents. You probably have a you know, uh, mature DSAR process. So, and, and that's because we've had to comply with the GDPR. And then now again, the, the kind of the landmark uh, CCPA and, and, and the emerging state law. So I guess what I'm saying, Cam, is that, um, you know, based on, and, and to, to Dave's point, this, this bill is in current draft is not going to be what we're going to see next year. Right? right. So, so I think for us as professionals, we, we kind of, already have a really well-established baseline. Um, and it's just, again, going to be up-leveling that for any outlier uh, re uh, uh, requirements that come out of the actual final version of, of APRA, which I'm, again, going to be using. <laughs> so I'm, yeah, I'm, we can plug for Transcend. I mean, like Transcend is going to continue to watch this every step of the way, right? So I think absolutely. the best thing that CPOs and privacy professionals on this uh, you know, webinar can do is just continue to stay close to transcend as we'll be kind of sending updates um, at, at every step here. So. Yeah. And as we always do, transcend is going to be on and their product team and our product team uh, are going to be on top of, of, of these types of requirements and making sure that our tooling is, is going to be reflecting what, what comes out. Yeah. Any, um, and again, this goes back to your point too, Dave, on, on the government side of things, this could all change depending because this is a an election year too so things could also take a 360 180 i don't even know by next year so um yeah it's, I mean, interesting. it's a great point cam and when i talk about election year and, and why i said this was a surprise to everyone politicians are especially on the house side right they're up for election every two years so i don't think their their natural inclination is to to not rock the boat and do something hugely controversial that could put them in hot water and jeopardize whether or not they're voted to come back uh, uh, for the next session. So I think that's usually why you see less uh, congressional activity right before an election, but clearly this is going against that norm. Uh, so yeah, I think it'll be really interesting to see whether or not they can get this, get this passed. Never a dull moment in privacy. Never a dull moment. But Transcend's got, got you uh, at every step of the way here. We sure do. <laughs> Absolutely. Is there anything you guys want to, uh, any key takeaways, anything you want to leave the, the listeners with? Again, I think for, for operational privacy pros, it's, it's um, you know, uh, engaging with your outside counsel, engaging with your, your, your privacy platforms to, to get perspective and to see what they're, they're, they're worried about or what they're doing. It's just you know keeping we have we, we have the same outlets of, of information and updates so i think again uh we're gonna have to wait it's a wait and see and and keep going and keep doing what we're doing in terms of making sure that our our privacy programs are um up leveling as they are needed love it we have yep. five minutes left um if anyone is still with us which i think i believe we do have a good amount uh, any questions you have send them our way i'm kind of just monitoring the the chat right now so let me refresh it just in case before we call this, but if you if you have further questions and it's past this, please reach out. You can reach out to me, Ron, Dave. I'm just going to offer them up. Absolutely, <laughs> uh, we're happy to to help guide you or just have further discussion on this stuff because this is what we love doing. Yeah, and um, sorry for the technical difficulties up front, but I think this was a incredible kind of. He said, he said, kind of uh, interplay between Dave's expertise on the Hill and then me having that operational kind of viewpoint. So I think this is um, extremely um, helpful for folks, I'd say. Should we hit yeah. the road, Ron, and do our own road show? I think uh, so. Ooh. Talking about APRA. There we go. No, no, no. I think that's actually, I'm going to keep that. Uh, I'm actually going, so quick plug, I, I'm, I'm starting my uh, <laughs> field CPO field trips and, and Dave. I think that would be a good um, segment for sure. I love it. I love that. Yeah. Hopefully we get some feedback from the folks here, but I, I definitely think um, this was a good kind of view of both sides of the, of the, of the issue. Yeah. So stay tuned for that. Cause we'll have great, um, you know, content and things to share and it's exciting. This is going to be a, it's going to be a great 2024. And uh, if something happens with this bill, that'd be even more amazing for the privacy community. So, um, well, Great. with that, we'll let uh, everybody have their time back. And uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you both for being here. We appreciate it. Thanks thank all. You.
Thanks, Cam and Dave. Appreciate it. Take care, guys. Bye.